Thank you so much for being here at Pioneer Works. Um, for those of you new to us, because I see some unfamiliar faces, Pioneer Works is a nonprofit cultural center dedicated to multidisciplinary education, programming, and production. Between our major exhibitions and programming throughout the year, we also host workshops and classes, as well as residencies across our five disciplines, which are music, science, technology, and of course, art. We strive to make art and culture accessible for all. For early access programs, uh, to, for early access to programs like these, as well as member events, by the way, and discounts on the bookstore, concerts, and classes, please check out our membership program, which you can find uh, information about on our website, as well as at the book table over there. Uh, membership starts at eight dollars a month. And um, there are a lot of really awesome benefits, including you know, members-only events and whatnot. Just find out more over there. Um, so this year, uh, between our bookstore on Van Brunt and our in-house publishing imprint, Pioneer Works Press, we will be working toward creating a space for literary arts among our existing disciplines, which makes me extremely happy. Um, we are so thrilled to be partnering with like-minded like, with like new institutions like One World launching books like Geordie's that think expansively as we do about the power literature can have on a public, on a greater public. Thank you for being here tonight, One World Authors. <laughs> so, before I hand things over to Chris Jackson, the publisher of One World who needs little introduction, I want to say uh, that the meta editor actually in Jordy's stellar debut novel that we're celebrating tonight, Confessions of the Fox, uh, they begin their story explaining exactly how the manuscript that you're about to read uh, brought them to tears, uh, which is something I also experienced in my first reading of Editor's Forward, which I think afterwards I sent Victory uh, an email with the subject line, Subway Tears, <laughs> on my way home from the Random House office. Um, but in that uh, foreword, uh, the editor writes, uh, I cry when I see if only if, uh, if when I see a flash, if only briefly, that something other and better than this world already exists in potentia. And I don't know what it was about that, but it just kind of <laughs> broke me down. Um, because we are so happy, I think, in these times especially, to imagine with you tonight those other better worlds. Um, so thank you for being here. And I'll hand it over to Chris Jackson. Hello, everyone. Um, it's so great to be here. Um, so I just want to thank our host, first of all, Pioneer Works, and especially Camille, wherever she is. There she goes. Um, <laughs> who's been an amazing, enthusiastic, responsive, creative partner in putting together this event in this amazing space. Uh, we couldn't have asked for a better match. And if you look at the strange sort of steroidal bookmark that I think all of you got, um, you'll see that both of our mission statements are singing from the same songbook. So I'm really happy that we're able to do this event with Pioneer Works. I'd also like to thank the hardworking and creative team at Random House and One World who helped put it together, especially Maria Brackle, who spearheaded the project with care and diligence while taking care of her day job of uh, running Random House's incredible publicity department, uh, which includes Emily Yassif, uh, Greg Kuby, Dara Parikh, Stephanie Redaway, who also were key contributors to the night. I'd like to thank One World's awesome uh, art and design team, including our award-winning art director, Greg Malika, our designer, Sharanya Duvrasala, and Nina Soor, who, oh, gone. That thing that was hypnotizing you moments ago. She uh, animated that. Uh, and finally, I want to give a shout out to One World's editorial team, Victory Matsui, uh, Nicole Counts, and Cecil Flores, who were incredibly instrumental, more instrumental than anyone really, in bringing together these authors and um, having cultivated their work uh, so they could be here tonight. Um, and most of all, I'd like to thank you for being here tonight. As a great writer, Jay-Z, once said, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, so thank you. We talk a lot at One World about books, as you might imagine, uh, the physical and digital object, which is what our company is in the business of putting out, but also a lot about writers and readers, the people our work is meant to serve. Historically, and probably in our personal histories too, reading books has always been both a public and private experience. Books offer a complicated solitude. A good book is a great excuse to close the shutters and dive deep inside ourselves. But the irony is that in that solitude, we often find the deepest connections. James Baldwin once said, 
Uh, it was through reading that he learned that the things that tormented him the most were the very things that connected him with all the people who were alive and who had ever been alive. But books can also be an occasion for more social forms of connection. The earliest books in Europe were written in, that were written in vernacular languages were meant to be read aloud and enjoyed collectively. And of course, the global tradition of oral storytelling predates and continues beyond the invention or the printing press. People have always come together to hear stories being told. As James Baldwin might have said, but didn't, it was at readings that I learned the things that tormented me the most were the things that connected me with all people. So this event is part of our larger project at One World to honor both forms of connection, the connection in solitude between a writer and her single reader, and the connection in physical space between storytellers and a community of readers. The joy of the public side of this project is not just about bringing readers in contact with each other and with our writers, but bringing our writers together too, so they can share their works and their works in progress with each other, talk about ideas and process, find points of tension and harmony, support and inspiration. This is our second major event. The first, which launched our nonfiction list, was about nine months ago and featured ta Coats, Coates, Kimberly Drew, Kiara Hudes, Eddie Wong, and Jenna Wortham. And we're planning many more here and around the country. So be sure to sign up for our newsletter, which I think is on, our, on that big bookmark, um, so you can stay up to date on all of that. Now, I don't want to state the obvious about the immensely troubling times we're living in, but I will offer a phrase that Grace Lee Boggs uses in her book, The Next American Revolution, these are not just times to try our souls, but these are times to grow our souls, which I read as a call for connection and communion, for finding spaces where we can share our stories and explore ideas with people who may not know what we know or agree with everything we think, but who still endeavor to see and understand us as fully human. To grow our souls means to tend to the autonomous, unconquerable region of our imaginations, but also to connect with each other and imagine different worlds together. So I hope you'll join us not just here tonight, but our other events in the future and also in the pages of our books. So I'm so grateful for the four writers who've come from near and far to share their stories with you this evening to celebrate the launch of One World's first work of fiction, Jordi Rosenberg's Confessions of the Fox. And I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction of the four readers who will then come up in turn. Uh, Kali Fajardo Anstein is our furthest traveler arriving from the distant shores of uh, Colorado. Her stories have appeared in the American Scholar, Boston Review, the Bellevue Literary Review, the Idaho Review, Day One, and the Southwestern American Literature. She's been a resident at uh, Yaddo, Hedgebrook, Hub City Press, and was awarded the 2017 Laura Hriska Fellowship through Soho Press for her novel In Progress. Um, she holds an MFA from the University of Wyoming, and we're excited to publish her debut short story collection, Sabrina and Karina, next spring. And that's uh, Kali. <laughs> Next to her is Brooklyn's own Mira Jacob, and who's the, <laughs> the author of the critically acclaimed novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing. Her recent work has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, Vogue, Guernica, Buzzfeed, The Telegraph, Bookinista, and The Schofield. She lives right here in Brooklyn with her husband and son, both of whom feature in her graphic memoir, Good Talk, which we're really excited to be releasing early next year. So that's Mira. Um, <laughs> ta Coates is the author of three best-selling books, The Beautiful Struggle, Between the World and Me, and We Were Eight Years in Power, all of which I had the pleasure of editing um, and working with ta on. Between the World and Me won the 2015 National Book Award. ta is the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship. He lives in New York with his wife and son and will be publishing his debut novel, as yet untitled, uh, next year. And that's ta -Nahasi. And finally, Jordi Rosenberg, whose Confessions of the Fox launched today. Jordi Rosenberg is a transgender writer and scholar. He's an associate professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he teaches 18th century literature and queer trans theory. He lives in New York City and Northampton, Massachusetts. Now today, the New Yorker ran a review of his book, Confessions of the Fox, just one of many incredible raves for the book, calling it many wonderful things, but it ended with this note. Foxes, the review did, foxes are getaway artists. They leave behind only traces and symbols. One virtue of Rosenberg's novel is that it never tries to cage the wild animals at its heart. Jack, who's a character in the novel, confessions uphold two contradictory claims, that love inscribes the body and that love refuses to mark the body. For these characters, what is beloved flourishes in its own private mystery. Perhaps that is why Voth, another character, at last plotting an escape, cannot tell us where he is going. I'm waiting for you in the future is all he offers. Catch up, catch up. So here to begin this night, of catching up and imaginative narratives 
It's Kali, Fajardo, and Fumi. Hello, I am so excited to be here and I am deeply honored to be on One World. I'm going to be reading from my story, Tomi, and it's from my forthcoming collection. When my nephew Tomi was a baby, I stole the thousand dollars his mother Natalie kept in her closet. It was for his college fund. She had placed it in a rinsed out mason jar, wrapped in a knockoff Fendi scarf, and hidden beneath a pile of bald socks. I crept hungover and dazed across their carpeted floor, taking that jar and spending everything on liquor and clothes within a week. Natalie always suspected it was me, though my brother Manny said I would never do something like that. Who, he demanded to know, would steal from their own blood. Six years later, I stole a 94 Honda Civic and drove head on into an elderly couple's picture window at four in the morning. An old man wore striped pajamas as he dusted shattered windshield glass from my face. Blood flooded my mouth, a tooth edged down my throat. The old man placed a towel on my lips and told his wife to call an ambulance. When he leaned back through the car door, his pajama arm resting on the steering wheel, he said, look at you, Hitha, you're just a baby. I served my time at La Vista Correctional Facility in Pueblo, Colorado. My family didn't call much and they never visited. I marked the days on two calendars, the first filled with illustrations of wildflowers, the second with photos of horses in empty, rustic fields. Toward the end of the horses, my attorney wrote to say that I was up for early release, so long as I got a job and I had a place to live. I planned on moving into a halfway house off Colfax Avenue. When Manny called to say that I could live with him, and told me, won't Natty, let Natalie be pissed? I asked Manny over the phone. She's gone, he said. She left me. I told him I was sorry, even if I had seen it coming from the beginning. Why are you doing this, I asked him. You're my sister, Cole, my blood. But please, don't fuck up this time. When he was 22 and I was 15, Manny inherited our family home after our father died of a heart attack while shampooing his hair. Our mother was already long dead. When I was very little, she swallowed an entire bottle of painkillers. At La Vista, I read in an anatomy book that the heart has no nerve endings. And for a little while, I believed my parents died without any pain. We grew up on Denver's north side in the shadow of Mile High Stadium a neighborhood that was now called Highlands, though only white people said that. Our house was a slender brick square that rested on a high plot, giving it the illusion of something great among knifing condos and black BMWs. I was released from La Vista on an early Tuesday morning in late autumn. Manny met me outside in his white Tacoma that smelled of corn chips and coffee. He wore his canvas Carhartt his dark hair newly streaked white. Look at you, he said, pinching my cheeks. Someone called Jenny Craig. Yeah, prison don't have no Bud Light. Damn shame, I'll get you some chicharrones for the road. He turned up the radio on a Neil Young song and beat out the chorus on the steering wheel. A red rosary dangled snake-like from the rear view mirror. Taped to the dash were Virgen de Guadalupe prayer cards and a Sears baby picture of Tommy. How is he, I asked, brushing the picture with my hand, since Natalie's been gone. I don't know, sad. Manny pinched tobacco into his left cheek. He's failing a class called Read and Relax. <laughs> you tell me how a person fails to read and relax. We drove by a yellow traffic sign, bullet hole and bent, warning against picking up hitchhikers when near a correctional facility. The sky beyond was larger than I'd ever seen, an oily gray with arrowheads of birds. Impressive, I said. Manny parked the Tacoma outside our home, and I pointed to the glass high-rise that had appeared where a vacant warehouse once stood. It reflected the clouds, the winged tips of the mountains. That's pretty fancy. Yeah, real fancy, Manny said. It also ruins my view of the stadium. These property taxes are fucking me, but we were here first, and I'll be damned before I move to the suburbs. 
Inside, Tommy was on the living room floor. His hair was a mop of black strands as he clutched a video game controller, swaying right and left, forward and back. His glasses were smudged with spotted fingerprints reflecting the sparkling blue lights of the television. Manny hung his Bronco's hat on the rack and unzipped his Carhartt. He had grown softer around his middle, and I wondered if I looked older too. Get up, Manny said. Go say hi to your auntie. Tommy flung forward and video game blood splattered the screen. Hi to your auntie, he said. Aye, Manny walked over, swatting Tommy's head with his right palm. Don't act like such a shithead. She's traveled a long way, son. Thank you. That was beautiful. Hi, guys. Um, I am going to be reading you a little bit of a book that I'm drawing. And I'm so glad to see you tonight. It was funny, I was talking to my best friend earlier today and I said, oh my God, is there any hope? And she said, I'm on Twitter right now trying to figure that out. <laughs> don't, don't go to Twitter to figure that out. <laughs> Come here. Um, I'm really glad we're here tonight together. So I'm going to read to you, here's a clicker from a book I am writing and drawing. It is called Good Talk, Conversations I'm Still Confused About. You don't need to know much about this except that at some point I will be using an Indian accent. That is the accent that I had before I went to school. It's the accent of my parents and it's an accent I miss. Ready? You ready? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> All these people are running around. <laughs> All right, can we start? Okay, you got me? Yeah, I got it. I'm pressing it, it's nothing happening. There you go. Growing up, I thought American parents, the really cool ones anyway, smoked pot with their kids. That did not happen. My parents were insanely strict. So you guys only got high on holidays? Sometimes when I was feeling bad about having parents that would never really understand me, I would lie in bed imagining all the epiphanies the stoned American families around us were having. Dad, I really just don't want to be a doctor. You know, I think I only wanted that for you because my own childhood was filled with so much in instability, but I get it. Be a musician. <laughs> Want some ice cream? <laughs> in terms of understanding my life choices, my parents were pretty epiphany free. Recurring parental conversation, 1984 to 2003. But being a writer isn't a real job. Do something that gives you stability. You can always write on the side. She's right. You have to be able to support your children. I don't even want children. You have to want children. <laughs> the year after I got married, the recurring parental conversation stopped. Mira, I have the cancer. No. Yes. It's going to be okay. Dad. My dad getting cancer was not okay. It was not okay the first year with the first surgery. And by the third year, second surgery, and fifth round of chemo, it was really not okay. Eat one chapati, just one. You're wasting away. I can't. Dad, have you tried smoking weed? Are you nuts? The drugs will kill him. <laughs> Things you didn't imagine doing in your 30s. House of the guy everyone bought weed from in high school. Oh, hey, does um, Dave still live here? My name is Cooper, I am six. <laughs> That's fantastic, goodbye forever, Cooper. <laughs> Thing you did not imagine doing ever. Um, hey, it's Mira, I was wondering if you knew where I could get some, it's uh, for my dad. Guy who was always high in high school. Dude, seriously? That one guy you went on a date with. Wait, who is this? One of the carpool moms. You betcha. Come on over, honey. 
The first time I brought weed home, it did not go well. Oh my God. You know the drug dealers. Who saw you do this? The FBI will come. You will get us arrested. Do you want to get us arrested? What kind of child are you? Your mother cannot go to a jail for a crime she did not commit. I will not let this happen. Your friends gave it to me for you. My friends don't. Yeah, they do. No. It's going to be okay. Mira. Getting my dad high wasn't easy at first. Absolutely not. It will help you eat. No. If you eat, mom will be happy. Give it to me. <laughs> this is your dad on drugs day one. Can I have a little more rice? Yes, what else? Do we have ice cream? Nobody move. I'm going to go buy ice cream. This is your dad on drugs, week two. Do you know what is so funny? <laughs> My old friend Charles comes and sees me every day at 420, and do you know what he wants to do? <laughs> I can guess. This is your dad on drugs, month three. Can you believe this Google Earth? It's a miracle. I can sit here in my chair and fly pushoomed anywhere in the world. Last night, I went to the Grand Canyon and the Forbidden City. What a time to be alive. What a beautiful life. Dad. What? Nothing. Great idea. One night, a few months after he started smoking, my dad finally asked, you want some? Wait, really? I almost didn't do it because it wasn't in character with what I knew of him, but then neither was dying of cancer. We got high. We ate chips and ice cream and peanut brittle. We watched TV. We laughed loudly and for too long at everything. A commercial came on with an old man driving a little boy in a red sports car. It was summer on the television. It was winter outside. Something popped into my mind, not quite clear, but on the periphery. Something I would understand if I turned and looked at it directly. I turned and looked at my dad. He said it. I'll never know your children. Two years after my dad died, I had a son. Three years after that, I finished my first novel. Did Uppa like your book? He died before I finished it, so he didn't get to read it. Can you carry me? Hey, I have an idea. How about we put all the pages on the stoop and put, got all the pages and put them on the stoop, and when a big wind comes, it will blow them into heaven, and Uppa can read your book, and it will be so beautiful. What do you think? Dad. What? Nothing. Great idea. Thanks, you guys. I always like this. I always like this. That was such a beautiful, inspirational, incredible story. And um, no, it really was. Give it a round of applause. It's excellent. Uh, but then the flip side is I have to come up and be the bummer. Um, 
You knew this was going to happen, Chris. You set this up like this. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm going to read from my untitled novel, uh, which is coming out in 2019, uh, which will be uh, 400 years exactly from the moment that the first Africans arrived on these shores of America. Um, what you need to know is this. Hiram Walker is a slave. He's enslaved to his brother, Maynard Walker. I could only have seen her there, dancing on the stony half-barreled bridge, because that was the way they would have taken her some 15 years before, back when I was young, back when the Virginia earth was still red as brick and red with life. And though there were other bridges spanning the river goose, a ferry even, they would have bound her and brought her across this one, because this was the bridge that fed into the falling creek turnpike which twisted its way through the green hills and up the valley, then bent tragically and unerringly in one direction, and that direction was south. So it could only have been there that I saw her on a bridge that I had avoided as much as humanly possible because it was from that bridge that all my legions after watch night, having said their tearful goodbyes, having had their last look at the apple orchards and wheat fields, having remanded the tending of their own gardens to others as Cleve had done just bef as Cleve had done to me just before they took him they would look up and see looming above it all the great house of Lockless and the sight of that house where my father throned would have confirmed to them that their descent into that hell Natchez way as we then called it was indeed final and knowing the fact of these losses and the fact of one closer and how I had pushed the feeling of that loss into the down there of my mind, how I had forgot, but did not forget. I know now that this story had to begin there because no place in all the world promised more pain and no place in all the world promised more power than that bridge and the woman I saw there. And the woman was wreathed in ghostly blue, was patting Juba and balancing an earthen jar on her head and pounding the cobblestone with her bare heels, and a necklace of shells was shaking around her neck, and the jaw stayed fixed on her head like a crown. And I knew by this incredible feat that the woman, wreathed in ghostly blue, was my mother. No one else saw her. Not Maynard, who was then in the back of the new millennium chase, which my father had bought only a month earlier. Not the fancy girl who held him wrapped with all her wiles. And most strange, not the horse, though I had been told that horses had a nose for such things that extend out from other worlds and stumble into ours. No, only I saw her from the driver's seat of the chase. And she was, as I recalled her, and this is what was most alarming. I had not seen her since I was eight. And she seemed undimmed by time, dancing before me, just as I remembered her in those moments when she would leap into a circle of all my people, Jemima, Young P, Honus, Helen, and Uncle John. And they would clap, pound their chests, and slap their knees, urging her on in double time. And she would stomp the dirt floor hard as if crushing something under her heel and bend at the hips and bow like a servant then twist and wind her knees in unison with her hands, the earthen jar still on her head. My mother was the best dancer at Lockless, and I never forgot this because she gifted me with none of it. <laughs> but more, I never forgot it because it was dancing that brought her to the attention of my father and thus had brought me to be. And we were moving at a decent clip because all I wanted was to be home and to be free of him, though I could never in this life be free of him. Maynard, my brother, who was made my master. Maynard, who I hated and loved. Maynard, who held my chain and who I still, no matter, still long to see again. It was late in the afternoon, cloudy, and a cold, steady rain was now falling, and I could hear Maynard in the back with all his games and carnal boasts put upon the fancy, and I was trying all I could not to hear, pulling up any story I remembered, any tune I could recall, any verse that I might summon, anything that might take me elsewhere. And maybe that is what brought my mother before me, 
suddenly in the path of this speeding chase. When I yanked at the reins, the horse whined and scampered, but by then it was too late. We barreled right through her, right through my mother, and what happened next will challenge any sense of a natural world that follows natural law. But I tell you, I was there and I saw it happen, and have since seen a great many things such as this happen, things that violate our sense of cosmic order, expose the ends of all our knowledge and how much more lay beyond it. And it was such an event that then occurred, though I now know it did not so much occur as it was made to happen, made by me. The road disappeared beneath our feet and the bridge fell away. And now we were, all of us, in the water, under the water. And even as I tell you this, I feel myself back there again in the teeth of that river goose, the knifing cold going through my bones, the river rushing into me, and that particular burning agony that can only come from a man about to drown. But then I came up, breaking through black water and into a diorama of the world because that is how it all appeared to me. Storm clouds hung by unseen hands, a red sun penned low against them. And beneath that sun, hills dusted with grass and rocky shores pasted against them with fishing hamlets nestled in them. And then finally, surveying the reach of the water, I saw way back, far, far back, the double-barreled stone bridge, which I judged to be, my God, a half mile from my position. And the bridge seemed to almost be swimming away from me because the, car the current pulled me along. And when I angled myself toward the shore, it was that current still, or perhaps some unseen eddy beneath, pulling me downriver. There was no sign of the horse, which I now imagine must have been pulled under the water, logged by the weight of the millennium chase, and I am sorry for that even today because I know from what I tasted that evening that nothing, beast or human, should ever perish by the fire of drowning. Whatever thoughts I had on that horse's behalf, however, were broken by Maynard, making himself known as he had so often with hue and cry, determined to go out of this world in the selfsame manner that he'd passed through it. He thrashed in the waves, yelled, treaded a bit, disappeared under, only to reappear again seconds later, yelling, half-treading, thrashing. Help me high. And I remember this most clearly because then he said, please. And I remember this especially because he said it like the child he always was, begging. And it was one of the only times I recalled him speaking in such a matter that actually reflected the nature of our positions. Please, he said again. I can't, I yelled. We have found our way under the ox. And so I truly believed it. And with that admission of my fate, I felt my limbs submit and the mystery and confusion of events of all that had deposited me into the depths and nagged me no longer. And this time, when I went under, there was no burning. And as I sank into the depths of that sea, there was a weightlessness about it, so much so that as I sank, I rose too. I knew then that I must at last be going home, going to my reward. I thought of Lockless, my earthly home, which I was now leaving behind, and I thought of that family formed in the absence of a family. And as I thought of them, they appeared before me in that same ghostly blue as my mother. And I saw Athena there on wash day, an old woman heaving the large pots of steaming water and with the last of her powers, threshing the dripping garments until they were damp and our hands were raw. And I thought of Alberta, who I did love, and then I saw her in gloves and bonnet, like a woman of mastery, because that is what the task required of her. And I watched, as I had so many times before, as she hiked the bell of her dress to her ankles and walked down a back path to see the man who held her chained. And when she turned to wave, I felt the ache of a love that must always be incomplete. And then my mind journeyed further back still to those who'd gone down Natchez way. And I wondered how many of them might well have gone further and if any of them would be there to greet me. Perhaps my mother then, who just then flitted before my eyes, water dancing in the ring, 
or perhaps my Aunt Emma, who worked the kitchen all those years, and whose image now passed before me, hauling the holiday meal to all the assembled walkers, plates of fruit tarts and various breads of meat, though none of them for her and her kin. And thinking of all of this, of all the stories, I was at peace and pleased even to rise into darkness and fall into the light, to journey off to that home place where every moment is as daybreak over the mountains. And at that moment, I felt that I was not so much in the water as in a pocket swirling within it. It was warm and the chill left my bones and there was the blue light, the same blue that enwreathed my mother all around. All was peace, more peace than sleep itself, so much peace, in fact, that I became aware of a nagging weight which, which I had always taken as unchangeable, a weight which now proposed to follow me off into the forever. I turned, and in my wake, in the watery depths, I saw the weight, and the weight was my brother, howling, thrashing, screaming, pleading for his life. What I can tell you about the anger I then felt in that moment is that it was exponential. All my life, I had been subject to his whims. I was his right arm and thus had no arm of my own. And the anger of this welled up in me and then multiplied against itself because I had done this for a man of no dignity, a boy even who was so low that he would barge in upon his own brother's farewell. And at that moment, I had a terrible thought. Maynard would follow me into eternity, holding the chain the whole way. I looked back and saw Maynard, my little May, grappling after me, thrashing into that pocket around me. And when he swung his arms, the scenes which had appeared before me, the scenes which had been of so much comfort to me, of my mother, of my Aunt Emma, of Thena, of my Alberta, warped and buckled in the churning water. And the sight of this, and the fact of his pleading impotence, and the notion of another life where I must be man for two, overwhelmed me. I drew back my arm like a hammer, and when the hammer found my brother, he flew away from the blue pocket, and Maynard, my little May, pleaded no more. And I would like to say that I mourned him right then, or took some manner of note, but I did not. I was headed to my ending. This is what I believed. And I had not deprived Maynard of life, because that had already happened, so much as deprived him of a place in an afterlife that must be all my own. When I turned back again, there was my mother there before me. And I saw her kneeling before a boy. And she put her hand on the boy's cheek and she kissed him on the head, and she placed the shell necklace in his hand and closed his hand around the thing. And then she stood with both hands over her mouth, and she turned, and she walked into the big blue light, and the boy stood there watching, and then cried after her, and then followed after her, and then ran after her, and then fell as he ran, and lay there crying into his arms, and then stood again and turned, this time toward me, and walking over, he opened his hand, and he offered the necklace to me, and I saw, at long last, my reward. Thank you. I think you may not even have to do that because I think the sound is better on these, no? Is it? Yeah. Leave that hanging over my head, the whole thing. Um, okay. Um, thanks so much to everyone for being here. It's very hot. Um, <laughs> thank you to Pioneer Works for hosting this. I'm going to try to do the thank yous very quickly. Uh, thank you to my agent, Susan Gollum. For everything, um, thank you to the other readers. It is a huge, ridiculous honor to get to read with everyone tonight. I'm so excited for all these books. Um, thank you to One World. Um, thank you to Chris Jackson for his guidance and his confidence in this book. He said something to me I'm not going to even say, but he knows what it was. 
at one particular time, and if he hadn't said it, I would still be crying in a pan quotidian right now. <laughs> um, and the last person I want to thank, um, I bet there are probably some other editors here tonight, maybe. Um, I don't want to start like a battle royale of the editors. Um, but I will say that Victory Matsui is a fucking genius. Um, a genius. Um, and such a hands-on, uh, really, editor with in incredible integrity and attention and depth. Um, I just need to recognize them for one minute, because uh, this also is the One World sort of fiction launch, right? Um, one, one statistic that may give you a sense of Victory's amazingness if not the book itself, is uh, I went through my emails today to see, I just wanted to know how many emails I had from Victory. <laughs> I have 743 emails, and that's like not even, that's just the chains. Like there could be 15 replies within each one of those seven, 743. I have known Victory for 610 days. So <laughs> that is a lot of email. Um, so with all due respect to my dog, Victory has been my primary partner for the past <laughs> year and 10 months. I feel like there's some millennials here tonight. Hi, millennials. There's probably a word for the fact that I'm monogamous with Victory, but Victory has many authors. So there's a word for that. It's not something I would ordinarily want to enter into, but it works for us. Um, the <laughs> last thing I want to say is that I have come to trust Victory so deeply um, in a way that I really never knew was possible in terms of like a, re a collaborative and work relationship. And it is extremely meaningful to me that um, I wanted to read a section from the book tonight that's like really deep and profound where you see the lyricism of this narrator and the profundity of their thoughts. And Victory was like, no, I want you to read the sleaziest, stickiest <laughs> piece in this entire book. Um, so, because Victory said to do that, I am going to do that. Um, I want to say uh, thank you, Victory. I love you. Um, okay. All right. So, if this is bad, it's also Victory's fault. So, you know that now. Um, the only thing you need to know about this is that, so it's this uh, book, it's a found manuscript, this kind of um, sleazy uh, academic uh, scholar has found uh, a manuscript that might be the first 18th century um, transgender memoir of this real life prison break artist. And the editor character who's also trans is trying to authenticate whether this manuscript is real or not but none of that will come into this. This is just his disgusting internal monologue. Oh, no it's not, because it begins because he's been called into, he's being oppressed by his boss at, at his, the university where he works. This boss is, the, is called Dean of Surveillance Andrews. Um, okay. I knew something was amiss when instead of receiving Dean of Surveillance Andrews's comments on my annual review by email, I got a call from his office manager during my office hours to set up an appointment to discuss it. She suggested I come in immediately. I hustled to the meeting midway through my lunch where things did not have a collegial tone. Sit down, Dean of Surveillance Andrews blared as I entered. He was standing, gesturing in a very threatening manner to the ergonomic chair opposite his desk. He had the air not of a parent scolding a child, but more like a dog owner pointing out shit to the creature who made it. <laughs> I will add that it was not clear whether I was the dog or the shit. I sat. It was my first view of his new office on the 17th floor of the library. They really had done a spectacular job selling all the books and renovating in the style of a high-end Marriott. I still had my half-eaten turkey sub hanging from my right fist. Should I finish this sub while he fires me? I thought that seemed a step too defiant, but then I couldn't let it just hang there, stinking up the office with its warm turkey scent. <clears throat> I considered tossing it in the trash, but of course the deli odor would intensify and bloom from the bin. 
Honestly, only a psychopath throws away a half-eaten turkey sub in someone else's trash bin. <laughs> if he definitely is firing me, I promise myself I will throw this sub in his garbage can and walk out. I opened my bag and stuffed the sub, spilling from its mustard-spattered bouquet of butcher paper in between my university-owned crappy laptop and the attendance book I always mean to utilize in class, but I'm both too scattered and too Marxist to actually police my students that way. <laughs> Dean of Surveillance Andrews really had a nice office. I mused silently about how much thought had gone into appareling this room to make it seem like you were pampered by, while being fired. I wondered how many people had sat in this strangely buoyant ergonomic chair while being canned. Dean of Surveillance Andrews had been talking the entire time, of course. When I tuned back in, it seemed to have something to do with the language of my contract. It is the right of the university to requisition improperly utilized leisure hours if that period of improperly utilized leisure takes place on the premises. What improperly utilized leisure are you talking about, I managed. I determined to distract him with a metaphysical query. How can you improperly utilize leisure? I lobbed like an asshole. <laughs> <coughs> this he ignored. There have been reports of you playing phone scrabble during your office hours. Phone scrabble, I shrieked. Phone scrabble. He nodded at me really seriously. He made a sad, frowny administrator mouth to reinforce his point as if maybe I had murdered someone while playing Scrabble instead of just consistently and spectacularly lost at the game. Office hours are basically for phone Scrabble, I tried to explain. No one really wants to talk about the 18th century more than they already have to. My office hours aren't well attended. I realized too late this was not a good approach for self-defense. <laughs> but also, I was thinking, what reports? Which one of my senior colleagues went out of their way to tattle? Then I remembered the newly installed video cameras in the classrooms. And that's when I realized there must be one in my office as well. And while I'm realizing this, he's giving me the whole official rundown of how actually, no, office hours are meant for meeting with students. But failing that, office hours are meant for resting the brain and your other capacities for more productive work following the office hours. Playing phone scrabble takes away from that necessary rest, drying the eyes, preoccupying the mind, etc. And then he spins his desktop monitor towards me. It's a split screen. On one side, a spreadsheet shows how much phone scrabble I have in fact played in the past six months. <laughs> and on the other, a video playback generated from the university's in-house cloud, uh, in cloud network surveillance cameras show me in clip after clip, sutured together, my head bent, stuffing sandwiches down my gullet with one hand while moving letters around with the other. It was admittedly a lot of phone scrabble. <laughs> and this whole time I'm thinking, Okay, the Scrabble thing is bad enough, but please, God, let them not have on tape the time that I, oh, shit, there it is, Ursula, standing in the threshold, her pharmacist lab coat, that brilliant sterile white, her brown hair cascading down polyester, saying, hey, you know that manuscript you're working on? Have you figured out yet if it's authentic? And I'm like, well, everything, everything from that period is like a weird mishmash. I deliberately don't get into it at length because I don't think she's really asking me a question. She's trying to say something, signal something to me. You said it's really queer though, or trans or whatever, she furthers. See, this is what I mean about signaling. Let me just say now that if you're butch, queer, trans, et cetera, and you're alone in a room with someone and they ask you a question about queerness or transness or the history of queerness or transness or its archival documents, it's probably not because they want you to answer it at length. It's because they want you to understand that they're kind of queer and they may be inviting you to do something about it. <laughs> and maybe I should have done something about it. I know that technically, thanks victory, I know that technically speaking, I look like I could do someone pretty good. I'm aware, this is a character, I'm aware <laughs> that I have this sleazy but not creepy, says I, demeanor. It's sort of cultivated, but it's also just there, this wiry, wolfish aspect. You look at me and you just know you wouldn't have to be embarrassed by any shit you wanted to do or get done to you because I'm already giving this kind of shameless, gross vibe. <laughs> As we know, really taking one for the team here. As we know, 
Ursula already knows everything about me since she's my pharmacist for Christ's sake. So that was a green light right there. Not that that surprised me actually. A lot of women are relieved not to have to deal with bio cock. And to be honest, what I have going on intrigues them. It intrigues them libidinally, let's say. And I feel compelled to reflect here on the fact that what I have going on was intriguing even before the tea. So now it's just, well, I hope you don't think I'm an asshole for mentioning it. Or you know what? Think I'm an asshole. I don't care. You didn't spend your early sexual life trying to explain your junk to confused young women. Or perhaps you did. <laughs> then you remember, what is this, they'd ask. Are you a hermaphrodite? Reader, they did not ask this with appetite. But that's in the past. Because now we're all grown up and everyone's seen a thing or two of the world. And it turns out there's an entire population of women who really hunger for some mythic genital sublime shit. I mean, you would be surprised how many women like getting done by an unclassifiable monster. But it's been so goddamn long since I did any one that I'm just looking at the innuendos Ursula's dropping, kind of hanging in the air between us like I'm some kind of neutered benevolent alien who's landed amongst humans and is hearing someone speak in vaguely translatable language about something called sex. Well. Watching my failed hookup alongside Dean of Surveillance Andrews <laughs> was exactly as hot as you can imagine. <laughs> Between these shenanigans and the phone scrabble, he says, you now owe your workplace 80 hours of labor restitution. Next semester, you'll teach an extra seminar. And he means gratis. Just give the university an extra free, uncompensated class. And then the coup de grace. You're being put on unpaid leave for the rest of the semester. You will still have access to your office, but we've already reassigned your class. Access to my office? Oh, joy. My shitty office in an OSHA-condemned building. My office that would probably constitute a liability to house anyone who hasn't signed the no-fault office accidental death clause <laughs> recently instituted by the person we refer to as neoliberal provost. See how they fuck you? Do they see how, do you see how they fuck you? I was shaking so hard when I left Dean of Surveillance Andrews's office that I didn't even have the wherewithal to fling my turkey sub in his wastebasket. <laughs> Should I read to the end of that? I was gonna end there. I'm gonna end there. Thank you very much. That was so good. Let's give another hand for all of our readers. Thank you guys so much. Um, um, yeah, I just really appreciate the generosity of reading works in progress on stage. It's amazing. And Jordy, happy pub day. Jordy's book published yesterday. Um, and I love you too. <laughs> So I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and by the way, I'm Victory Matsui. I'm an editor at One World. Um, yay. And I'm so happy to be here. We have like a bunch of Random House people here who are working behind the scenes. Chris Jackson, Nicole Counts, and Cecil Flores as part of the um, One World editorial team. So it feels like a real like family event. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions of my own, and then I got this stack of questions that you guys asked, so I will turn to some of those after I ask some of mine. Um, so my first question, I can't really see you, is for ta and Mira. So you both have written successful books in the past, and the projects that you read from tonight are new genres for you. So, Mira, this is your first illustrated graphic memoir. ta this is your first novel. So I'm wondering what made you choose these new forms and what it is about these forms that help you tell the stories you want to tell. Um, so I started writing and drawing this book. My son was six. He was super obsessed with Michael Jackson. He was figuring out that he was brown. And Trump was rising at the same time. And the questions he was asking me were so insane. There was a time when um, he said, is, is Michael Jackson, is he brown or is he white? And I said, wait, you know, he's black, but he's 
brown, and he sort of turned white. And he's like, he turned white? And I said, yeah. And he goes, are you going to turn white? And I was like, no, I'm not going to turn white. He's like, daddy. And I was like, daddy's already white. And he goes, but was he always? <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, fuck. Um, and that, and that thing that was happening to him, he was asking so many intense questions at the same time. One time we were on the subway and just out of the blue, he goes, are white people afraid of brown people? And I was like, ah. Uh. Um, and that, it was one of those moments where I was like, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't have an answer for you. And these questions themselves are their own story. And a lot of times I would try to put something like that in an essay, right? We all try to do that. But the preamble to an essay, I started feeling the judgment in the preamble, the ways that people dismiss you as you're ramping up to even tell them about an experience and the ways in which they'll discount you. And so I just cut him out as a paper doll and I cut me out as a paper doll and I put us on some album covers and I just wrote the questions. And it was so freeing to do that because I felt like I didn't have to perform anymore. I felt like I didn't have to ask somebody to believe me. I was just telling them what it was. So in answer to your question, I think the thing that this has allowed me is a certain amount of freedom to just say the thing I am trying to say and not perform it for somebody that may or may not actually care. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I did this because Chris Jackson told me to. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even joking. Uh, I published my first book with Chris in uh, 2008 and after I was done, um, he suggested I try fiction. I don't know if that was because of uh, the book sales at the time. It's very funny to hear him say I have three best-selling books. That's a very recent development. <laughs> uh, so I don't know what compelled him to say that, but he, you know, he felt like I should try it. Um, so I've been working on this book for 10 years. <laughs> Better be good. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's funny to realize that, <laughs> you know. First you realize how old you are. Um, that's the first thing, but you know, I've worked on something for 10 years. It's just like, man, it's better get done. Um, the other piece of the question, uh, seriously, about why is, you know, I'm by training, well, I was a poet first, and then I moved over to, um, you know, journalism and, you know, essay writing and, and that sort of thing. And I think, A, when I made that transition, I left some things behind. But I think, um, in general, in our politics in this country, uh, people overrate the importance, I told you this already, uh, Victor, but uh, people overrate the importance of fact and argument. Um, there is this notion um, in, in our politics that if you just speak to the American public um, and provide them with accurate information and do so respectfully, they will then make the correct decision. Um, what this misses is there's a whole suite of information, a bank um, of stories and myths uh, that are downloaded into our brains from, you know, the moment that, you know, we, 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 we come out of our parents and, you know, enter into the world. The thing I think about is how cool I thought the Dukes of Hazard were when I was a kid, you know, um, and it took a while for me to figure out, you know, what was exactly on the, the General Lee, uh, the reason that... Uh, and why it was called the General Lee. <laughs> um, and what that said about me as a black person, you know? Uh, the, the reason that black people, you know, to, to, to this very day struggle about their physical appearance, struggle with the, you know, ability to consider themselves as, you know, beautiful human beings, physically beautiful human beings, is because there's a bank of stories that have been told about black people, about how they look, about the shape of their nose, about their lips, about their complexion from the moment we got here. And so it's tough in this moment, you know, to say, you know, to a young black child, no, 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 black is beautiful. When that child is going up against that entire bank of stories every moment that they walk out. So how do you reverse this? Well, I don't think you reverse it in the moment, you know, um, but I think what you have to do is develop your own bank of stories, your, your own myth, you know. Um, so from the political angle, I mean, that, that is, you know, a big part of what compels me. The trick is to actually write a good book, though. <laughs> None of that means anything if the book sucks. Yeah, I really love that idea of writing your own myth. And that 
kind of leads me to a question that I wanted to ask Kali and Jordi, which is about the places that you set your work in. So Kali, your short stories are set in um, Denver, Colorado, and they center indigenous and Chicana communities. And Jordi, you're writing in 18th century London and also the like bizarrely bureaucratic American college campus. And these are places that people might think that they know well. And I'm wondering what drew you to these places to write them a new or to write new stories or myths about them. Uh, okay, I will go. <laughs> well, it was a natural choice for me. Um, my family has been in the Southern Colorado region since recorded history on my mother's side. And when I started writing, it was the only thing I was writing about was place. But it wasn't until I went to graduate school at the University of Wyoming and I was, you know, I was living up in the American West. I mean, this was like this windy, dusty place where there was nothing to do but go to the indoor flea market and, and drink a lot if you were me. And I lived in like this 1890s hotel that had been frequented at one point by politicians and then another point by prostitutes. And I was like really living in the myth of the American West. And at that same time, I was reading a lot of books that were presenting the American West as this very white space, this very Anglo space. And I will say that I became very angry that I wasn't seeing my, you know, my family history, my people represented in any of these narratives. You know, it was a lot of like John Wayne and national parks and going out and trying to find yourself. And I was just like, well, my people were just living here. Like this is just where we're from. And when I started to pull these stories together into a collection, I started to see that that anger and that passion was coming out directly about Denver, a place that is rapidly gentrifying. So for me, the experience of walking around my city and my place has become a, an experience of grieving. And I wanted to present um, a side of the story that was prior to that. I wanted to show what it felt like to be in a place where I felt accepted and I felt that my people were thriving. And I think that there are ways to do that um, through these stories that are going to show you that this is, you know, there are other parts of the American West that isn't just all myth. You know, these are realities and people are living deeply entrenched in these for many years, hundreds of years. Uh, yeah, so wait, the question was, how did you come to these stories? It's kind of, I mean, more eloquently put. Uh, I mean, I think, I think that, um, and this is one of the things that's like just so amazing about One World, and, and I feel like One World knows so deeply, that I think a lot of stories come out of uh, the intersection of politics and passion. Not like you're like the attache to, to Joseph Stalin and you're ordered to write this story, but that you like are, are, are possessed by some political questions and historical questions, at least for me. And so um, one of the things was that you know, um, in terms of just political community that I feel like I live in in the present, um, there's so much amazing work going on around prison abolition and queer and trans um, activism. And I think that, um, and, and I knew much of the history of that going back to Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson and those early movements for trans liberation. Um, but, I, and I was at the same time working on these 18th century archival documents about this very famous prison break artist in the 18th century. And I was kind of interested in thinking about how that intersection of sort of gender nonconformity and resistance to prisons and resistance to capitalism, um, what was its longer history? And one of the things I noticed about um, all the archival materials, because I think there's a question of history and then there's a question, and maybe this is where some novels come from, of what has fallen out of official history. All this material about Jack Shepard, so much of it described him as very um, effeminate and gender, what would be described now as gender nonconforming. And I think I just thought that aspect of him had kind of fallen out of how people imagine him. And I think on a certain level, I just thought, oh, this character is trans. Not that he would have thought of himself this way, but that he represented a certain intersection of like hatred of capitalism and like, a cer certain forms of embodiment. Um, and another thing that fell out of the histories at the time was that his like primary partner, main partner that's often referred to in the material um, was this 
woman reputed to be a sex worker and also kind of his partner in crime, she was described in a very unkindly way in the 18th century documents, very sexist, like this vixen, that femme fatale. I do love a femme fatale, but you know, I mean, <laughs> I think, all right, but anyway, this wasn't represented lovingly. <laughs> and who like lures him into this life of crime and um, I th but also at the same time, there were all these records that Jack's first prison break was actually breaking Bess out of prison. And I thought, oh, there's a love story there. Like just, you know, like this is a love story and it's fallen out. So it was very kind of sentimental on that level. Okay, I wanna ask you and ta about magic because you're both kind of writing these historical novels um, that are based in reality but have some sort of speculative elements to it, whether it's apparitions or supernatural forces. And I'm curious, what you think speculative elements help you say about the past? Like if there's some sort of truths that that helps you access? Um, hmm. Oh, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I was a kid, Harriet Tubman was like, um, you know, in every black history, you know, everybody knew about Harriet Tubman. She was an enslaved da 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 da. And, um, well, not da 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 da. <laughs> Harry Tubman's very important. She's in my book. Come on. Um, and my family is uh, from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, where Harry Tubman is from, uh, where Frederick Douglass. That's where my family was enslaved on my mother's side of the family. And later, when I went to read biographies of Harry Tubman, I, I don't know, like, like when I was in school, like it struck us, and I think this is like one of the things school does. It makes things that should be incredibly exciting and adventurous rote and boring. And I don't know how Harriet Tubman became rote and boring, but th they did it. <laughs> they really, they really, I mean, they put it on a multiple choice quiz, you know, or, or whatever, you know what I mean? But this, this, you know, actually is quite, you know, the story. This is a woman who, uh, when she's a child, uh, is struck in the head by, you know, a weight, suffers from seizures for the rest of her life, uh, frees, we don't actually don't know, you know, um, some outrageous number, whatever the number is, of enslaved uh, people, all the while suffering from seizures, you know, actually disabled, you know, but somehow repeatedly, you know, just outwits this system such to the extent that biographers to this very day don't, they're not completely sure what route she was taking. And I love those spaces where people don't know, right? Because that's what magic is. You know, that's your opportunity really uh, to create. And so when I saw that, I saw, oh, okay, that's where I'm supposed to go, you know? Um, so I, I don't know what truth we'll get to out of that, you know? But just as a, a sort of a narrative piece, I mean, it just, it, it, it felt right. Yeah, so I mean, I feel like the, one of the things that we know and think about supernaturalness and truth telling is like, I mean, I didn't write Aaron Dottie Roy's book, Capitalism, a Ghost Story. We know, you know, capitalism is a ghost story. Like it's populated by ghouls. Everything is horrifying. And that is the truth. And I mean, even to the extent that like, you're not gonna all remember this Swiffer commercial where the Swiffer is like animate and is singing baby come, no, the mop. Is, has been thrown over for the Swiffer and is singing like, baby, come back. And to the woman who mocked, so what I'm saying, like, it's not normal that, you know, so <laughs> these things are real. Like, it's really true that capitalism is populated by things that are animate, that are like, maybe not technically animate, but they technically, like, they are. So there's that. But on the other hand, I think also, there is this like very intense level, I think, I, I, I didn't only want to tell the story that way, and I, I think most most people maybe wouldn't really want to read a story that's just about the Swiffer and the mop, <laughs> maybe. But um, there's this question of like um, the force of the past and the force of history on the present, you know, and the the way that like when a revolutionary has passed, when you and we always say they're present, like present, right? And it's just like, they are still here, but really, what are our de debts to the past? And that's also something that comes in when thinking about transness, thinking about our debts to the people that fought for this, the people whose names we know, the people whose names we don't know. Um, what do we owe that past? And what is the weight of it on us? And what is the beautiful continuation of it upon us? 
and then not be morbid, but and then we will die, and people will not know our names, but there will be a force into the future, and to live toward that, I think is so, trying to write a book, I guess, about that. <laughs> what happened? Okay, I wanna ask, <laughs> so many things to ask, but I, need, I wanna ask Mira and Kali a question that's specific to your project, that's about children. Because I think both of you write so beautifully about kids, both like the wisdom and the humor that they have and inspire. And um, I'm curious about, so Mira, you talked about your son asking questions about Michael Jackson and um, Kali, a lot of your characters in short stories are these children who are trying to make sense of a rapidly changing Denver. So I'm curious what things you think children get right that the rest of us get wrong. I think that children are a lot more empathetic than most adult people. And um, actually, I think children just in general aren't given enough credit. You know, they're incredibly funny. They can be incredibly smart. They can make these, like, these biting remarks to you, too, that are really mean and hit you in a spot that you didn't know you had. It's like this weakness that children can seek out. Um, but I, I think that my child characters, um, they're, they're just a lot closer to the ancient wisdom that their grandmothers are always trying to beat down them. And when I, so I grew up in a family of seven children, so I was always around children. And I carried their sort of truths over into my stories. Uh, but I don't know about them getting things right, but I think that they just function as people. And a lot of the times we look them over and we don't think of them as, as smart as they are. Um, but I will say that it really hurts to get, you know, made fun of by a child. And a lot of my child characters <laughs> will make fun of you. So <laughs> I hope you enjoy them. <laughs> I think, you know, what's been so interesting to me with my son is there's a level of questioning that happens when you're detached from shame, mm -hmm. right? So when you don't know to feel ashamed of asking a certain question, you'll just ask it. And there's something so amazing about that in that when my son asks me those questions without shame, all of a sudden I'm forced to deal with how ashamed I am of so many things. And even trying to answer him, I feel myself wanting to be the better person to say the better thing, but actually being the asshole I am, you know, like all of those things <laughs> coming out of me at once. And like even th the other day we were at the, we were at the grocery store and um, at a bodega, and of course there's like a condom stand, it's like right next to us, and the kid goes, what are big cocks? <laughs> and I was like, what? And he goes, that says big cocks. What are big cocks? And I was like, I don't wanna, we don't, we don't need to, this is not a thing we need to talk about. <laughs> And when we left, I was like, it was, it, was, it was a penis. And he goes, a penis? Someone calls a penis a cock? I mean, it was just like all the way down the street. And I was like, this is a lot of information you're asking me. And he has zero filter for how the universe might be taking his question. So like our neighbors are passing us as this is happening. He's not worried about how this makes him look. And, and I felt, and it's, it's a recurring pattern with us, I find, that he just asks the hard, strange question, and I'm sort of the baffled adult trying to figure out how to how to give him the version that will mess him up the least, and often, <laughs> you know, often failing at that, frankly. Okay, I'm gonna ask my next question without shame then. Um, <laughs> I, so one of our other One World writers, Victor Laval, recommended this book to us called The Anatomy of Story. Victor's an amazing writer, by the way. Highly, he's a novelist, he's a genius, <laughs> such a good writer. Um, and so when I started, it's, a, it's like a step-by-step -step guide to how to write a really good story. And when I started reading it, I um, thought it was gonna be like about how to write a com commercially successful book or like how to lift your craft to a certain level of artistry. But the first question he asks, like the very first piece of advice he gives to writers is, if you're gonna write a book, write one that will change your life. So I wanted to ask any one of you who wanna answer, um, how has writing this book changed your life, if it has? Is that good advice? Well, <laughs> we could debate that. I mean, how would you know? I'm just asking questions. I, mean, I, I think that's a good question. Huh. I do think that 
think about changing someone else's life when you're writing? Like, are you thinking about maybe transforming an audience or transforming a, a reader? I, I think about things I can't let go of. You know, it's like the thing that's like stuck here, you know, in the car that you go to bed thinking about, you wake up thinking about. And frankly, I almost would say it's the thing that, and I'll speak for myself, I would be happy doing even if it turned out only five people read it, you know? Um, I think it's really, really important because you work so hard, you know what I mean? It, everybody up here has worked so hard um, and more often than not, no one reads it, you know? Um, that's the reality of, 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 of most books, you know? First reading I did for Beautiful Struggle, it was like five people there. I don't even think Chris came, man. I mean, it was <laughs> Damn, my editor ain't even come to my first read. Jesus. That's how insignificant I am. But it's all good, you know what I mean? Because I had a ball doing it, you know what I mean? It was like, wouldn't have done it any other way. I was very proud of that, you know, those five people that were there, you know? Um, I think if you can do that, you're okay. Like, if you can feel like that, you good, you know? I think... Um when I was writing this book, sometimes my son would be asking me these questions, and they're so funny, right? They're so funny, and then they're so harrowing. And sometimes I was going to sleep and kind of weeping to just hold the weight of what he was doing because I realized that we don't come out hardened in a certain way. We don't come out in these embarrassed bodies. We don't come out feeling like we're freaks. Like, there's a lot of things that tell us that, and he was in the pre-freak moment, and he was, and it was like coming down on him. And I saw it coming for him. And at the same time, these questions that he asked, um, it's like I couldn't hold the weight of them by myself. And so I just, I just wanted to be a witness for them. Like I just wanted to put them somewhere for safekeeping, to like make something for that. And that's, I just needed to do that for myself. And especially right now with, all of this, it feels really good to put them somewhere where I feel like they're safe. Okay, I'm gonna ask some audience questions now. Okay, did someone else wanna answer? Should I turn the mic on? Okay. Okay. This one says, B, we gave you a selection of questions. Okay, that's not a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kali, what is the role of research in your work especially as it pertains to a specifically forgotten female past? That's a beautiful question. Thank you, whoever asked that. I love that question. Uh, research has been really interesting. So for my, my short story collection, most of the stories are contemporary. One is set in the, in the 1950s in Denver, and that did require some research um, of cold cases, of uh, murder cold cases in the city. But for my novel that One World is also publishing, I've done extensive research. Um, it's a historical novel set between 1890 and 1833. And a lot of what I was trying to uncover didn't exist in um, these collected record formats because just frankly, the museums and the archives just didn't care about the population of the people I was writing about. And then some of the records were, had been destroyed and weren't kept up. And um, I actually got into a <laughs> I got into like a big fight with a, an archive center in Southern Colorado. They had all these oral histories from Latina women from that this particular neighborhood that I was researching. And when they handed me the tape, the tapes were all destroyed. They were mislabeled. And I tried to like I wrote like everybody an email from sitting in this little private room where I was supposed to be listening to the tapes. I like went from executive director down and then just like went outside and like talked to them out there too. Um, but, you know, research has been such a fruitful and interesting and sometimes hard and difficult and sad thing, but I'm hoping that the things I'm uncovering, I'm going to be able to create more, more record keeping in that way. Okay, this question may have been a plant, but how much did the mission of the One World imp imprint impact your decision to be published with us? <laughs> It's for anyone <laughs> who wants to compliment us. <laughs> how did, how much did the mission of the One World imprint impact your decision to be published there? I mean, I have an answer for that. I have an answer for that because I 
I, so my book was actually with a different um, imprint and I was orphaned there and I sought you guys out. Um, so I will tell you guys what happened is like two days before I was supposed to turn in my book, my editor left for another um, place and I had a, one of those things where you just drop through your floor and cry alone in your cellar like, oh, no, it's gonna, no, it's, no it's there, I'm, I've just delivered the baby and nobody's gonna take the baby, who's gonna take the baby? <laughs> um, but I specifically actually did seek you guys out because I needed to have somebody call me on this specific conversation. And I know when I was working with different editors, the way I went, in my lifetime, I went right to, we're not gonna publish that, nobody cares about that, to I don't know that I really have an opinion about that, so like publish whatever you want. Like nobody got in here with me. And I needed somebody to get in here with me. And I, I was pretty sure that would be you guys. And it was completely devastating actually when it happened. <laughs> like, that is, there's nothing like those first round of edits to just feel like, oh my God, what did I do to myself? But, um, but it felt so good. I was telling a friend of mine, I don't think I've ever had my work edited before for content. I've had it edited for pacing or setting or, you know, all of these sort of technical things, but nobody's ever talked to me about the stuff that I'm caring about or like hitting me in the face with my own assumptions. And it felt so good to, to be able to do that. Yay, thank you. <laughs> you can find our mission on the back of your program. Um, so here's one for Tanahasi. How different is writing fiction from nonfiction? Easier, harder, or just different? Um, it's just different. Uh, I mean, it's harder for me because it's, it's newer to me. Um, but, you know, one of the things that fourth draft um, and one of the things that happens is you know when you get to your fourth draft oh sorry third third let's not exaggerate third um, and one of the things that happens when you get to your third is it's like um, all right, I, at least my third I, I have the stories but I really you know want to fill the world out a lot more you know what I mean like what kind of wood was the secretary made out of <laughs> in the second floor office and did it have pigeonholes or not? You know what I mean? Like little details like that which are not really particularly necessary in nonfiction. And then you realize you can actually go overboard with that shit. <laughs> Nobody cares about the pigeonholes, dude. You know, I only care up to the point that it helps, you know, and maybe you go through this, you know what I mean, with your own, with your own research, kind of, you know, in terms of your stuff, but it's like, it's only like up to the point that it can actually cast the spell and make the people believe that anybody really cares. And one of the things was like, you know, just in the last bit of research I did, you realizing that like you get to a point and it's like, oh, this is where I make shit up. Like this is actually, you know, it doesn't matter, you know what I mean, what, you know, mindset necessarily, all of the research says, you know, this person, you know, would have been in or, or been like, like at a certain point, like, okay, I'm in the world, it's, it's, it's me now, or, you know, things not existing, you know, oh, okay, this is, this is the point. You know, at least when you're working, you know, with, with, with historical stuff. Um, at the same time, I feel like all answers to this are pretty premature because I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, what I, what I will say is this, and I, and I hope, you know, this doesn't come out the wrong way. Um, I was writing a style of nonfiction, right? And I got to a point where, and I hope I won't regret saying this, I felt like I knew how to write that style of nonfiction. Um, like I knew where everything went. I knew how to do the lead. I knew how to do all the research. I, kn I knew how to put it together. I, kn I knew, you know, we had to do the, the last essay for um, my last book, We Were Eight Years in Power. And when I went to do that essay, I knew exactly, I knew all the method, I, I knew it. I knew how to do it. And I was in such a place as an author where I felt like, yo, I could just run this back year after year after year after year. <laughs> You know, me and Chris always had this joke, you know, between the world and she, between, you know, <laughs> you know, we could just run it over and over again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's just keep it going. Between the world and we, we'll just do it, baby. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that's not, you know, what, what, you know what I mean? That's, that's, you know, and there are people that do that, the writers that actually do that, you know? Um, but that's not hot. 
It's nothing exciting about that. It's nothing that, you know, makes me want to get up in the morning and go, you know, hit it again when, 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 I, when I hear that. And so it's important to me to, like, be learning things, you know, as, as, as I do. So I don't, I don't know if this is going to work, right? Um, but in some ways, like, that's not wholly the point. This is like that is the point. But, I mean, <laughs> what I want is to, like, feel the excitement of, Wanting something to exist in the world, not really feeling like I'm at the level to make it exist in the world, and then stretching to get it to actually exist. That, that's the, the best part of writing for me. I love that. Okay, I think I have one last question, and it's for Jordy. Unless we have more time. Does anyone know how much time we have left? Two more minutes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Jordy, in two minutes, what inspired you to write a story within a story using footnotes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll, do, I'll give the fast answer on that. I mean, I think one of the things um, that's really just easy to say is that um, I went back and forth on that a lot, um, but I ultimately had to do it because um, I wanted there to be sort of more than one trans voice in the book and more than one uh, sort of main trans character that was manifesting their own relationship to their body so they could have different relationships. So, like to their own body, right? So like one of the main characters, I had made a decision just, I don't wanna show his body in any detail. It's gonna kind of be metaphorical, speculative. And then I felt sort of constrained by my own constraint. And so then I wanted to have this footnote character who's like mm -hmm. obsessed with his own body and is annoying and constantly talking about it. Cause like there's a lot of realities to trans people and like some of them are annoying. And so, <laughs> um, I just, I just, I just couldn't be so, you know what I mean? Like, anyway, so there was that. I think the another, another thing is, I mean, I will say real quick, I think uh, um, a lot of footnote structure novels have this like very sort of like elitist metafictional element um, where, I mean, I think that mostly that like came out of like cis boy Brown University students in the 90s, I'm not gonna say who, <laughs> where they're just like the whole point is like language is slippery, language is slippery. Like, yeah, okay, language is slippery. Like, is that a great book? I don't know. So I wanted to see if you could do a footnote structure novel that's like, it is like a metafiction, but it's also like just straight up genre, like portal, portal science fiction, where it's not just like constantly commenting on language is slippery, but there's actually a portal between the footnotes and between the present and the past, I mean the footnotes and the main body that's just like an homage to genre fiction because I love genre fiction. So that's it. Thank you for that question. Yay. Let's just give a hand to all of our wonderful writers. Yes, thank you all so much for that wonderful conversation and for being here tonight. Um, on the last note of that question, uh, we actually over on our book sales table where the signing with Jordy will be happening, we, so uh, at the end of uh, Jordy's novel, there is a resource list of all those footnotes. Uh, it's over 100 uh, resources, whether they're academic articles or books, or ancient texts that we couldn't find. Um, <laughs> but we have a selection of them over there for you to peruse kind of reading room style. And we highly recommend even just buying this book if you haven't already uh, to get like a 101 on queer theory um, and on uh, mass incarceration uh, as a topic in general, like lots of different threads there. Uh, or uh, also there's a lot of racial histories and theories there, anyway, there's, there's, it's a very rich resource list, but we have some of it over there and we highly recommend uh, purchasing uh, Jordy's book for that and also purchasing books from our other authors that read tonight. Um, thank you all so much and join us for dancing and a bonfire and bar. The rain has not started yet, so hang out.